This is Science, Health, and Healing with Dr. Majid Ali. And it is also good on this side seeing you. The Prime Minister of Great Britain, uh, Boris Johnson, said yesterday there might never be a vaccine for COVID-19, despite the huge global effort to develop one. Uh, please comment on that. Richard, if the Prime Minister was talking about a problem, let's say polio or smallpox, that there couldn't be a vaccine for them, I think that would be an enormous setback. We know that those two diseases have been eradicated worldwide, primarily by the vaccine. So one I'm talking about is polio and the other is smallpox. Now come to COVID-19. We have not had this kind of success with influenza virus in all these years, decades of work with influenza. So that when CDC and President Trump said that as an average 27,000 lives were lost in America to flu every year in the last average out 20, years. Well, that comes to 81,000 people every three years. You can't really celebrate a vaccine which is used extensively and yet the average number for lives lost every three years is 81,000. Because I think one thing which distinguishes flu um, as a disease and flu vaccine is that there is a big element of underlying conditions. So every time there is a flu epidemic, um, and now this is a pandemic, the underlying conditions become much more important. And they are always, uh, you know, diabetes, that's asthma, that's cardiovascular disease, that's autoimmune problems. So now, since we do not have a clear record that flu vaccines, which have been tried all these years, they have not really proven to be very effective. This actually, one reason why I am not devastated by this news, that there may not be a flu vaccine for another five years or ever, is I think they are saying, the British people are saying that COVID viruses are going to be intermingling with the existing supply genetic material of flu vaccine. So, they are going to be constantly muting, mutating so fast that whatever vaccine they come up with may not be very effective. So I think that, and personally, Richard, you know, my view is we are far better off focusing on the host, meaning human beings, than on the invader being the virus. And this, the new thing that is being spoken about, the Kawasaki, uh, disease in children in oh, COVID-19. Yes. Well, yeah, yeah. Let, let me, let that me, actually uh, makes the point tellingly. Mm -hmm. And it especially is, um, Richard, you know that I have been interested in molecular biology of oxygen and insulin homeostasis for our, some decades. Yes. And I've written extensively about that, published articles and the books, etc. Now, I believe that what they're calling is a mystery illness and that clinically shows up in children with skin rashes, with enlarged lymph nodes, with high fever, and with severe immune deficits. I believe that we need not consider it a mystery viral disease because I believe the real problem is a fungal toxins. And that is the commonest I would, I would say this and people would readily relate to it, that many mothers would see this, what is called, uh, you know, this whitish uh, stuff in the mouth, okay? Um, what's the right word for it? They, is, that, they, is that what's considered thrush? Thrush, yeah. okay. So when you see the whitish stuff in the mouth of babies, this is called thrush. And when you take a swab and put it under the microscope, that is candida fungus. Mm -hmm. And candida fungus is the commonest fungus which causes uh, yeast infections in women. 
So then, and the evidence, how did I come to this? It was really a pure accident, okay? I think somebody told me that there is a news coming out of London originally, but now about 100 children have been reported in New York City who have been diagnosed with this condition called Kawasaki syndrome, which I said is the syndrome of skin rashes. It looks like angry eczema, except that it's much angrier. Their eyes are red, their tongue is red, they will have enlarged lymph nodes, and the blood tests show clearly the evidence of an immune problem. And as it's much reading, more dangerous, much more dangerous, yes, correct? But as I was reading, and that's why what I'm going to say becomes, in my judgment, brings us some hope. See, viral problems which are very dangerous because we have no antiviral pharmaceuticals which work effectively for flu. This becomes a much more difficult problem to treat. Now, the fungal on the fungal side, the fungal infections tend not to be so acute. That's number one. Number two, we have good natural therapies for fungal infection controls, and we also have a pharmaceutical. Okay, so I believe if I had a choice of getting 10 children with fungal infections, and let's say the lab tests show that it is clearly a candida, and then the other side is mysterious Kawasaki syndrome in the context of COVID-19 pandemic, any time I would pick up the fungus because I already know out of 10, I probably have good results in nine, just in three, four weeks. It's now, nobody kind, of the that devil, kind of the devil you know versus the devil you don't know. Well, that's an important thing because we have a lot of experience. A lot of people have a lot of experience with yeast infection. That's a common mm -hmm. problem. Yeah. So, so what would you I do? Think, what would you do if one of your patients, a child, came down with this? How would you, what would be the first thing that you would do to treat this? Okay. Intravenous immunoglobulin has been used by many people and sometimes with very good results. So I would say in this context, I would certainly consider that, but I would never put all my eggs in the basket of intravenous immunoglobulin, okay? Mm -hmm. Because generally you are taking the proteins from other sources and they supposedly they have some antibodies. Okay, why wouldn't I? Because I think the results are going to be, they may be dramatic, dramatic in one or two reported cases, as I've seen, but they are not going to be very good. Our experience is that, yes, you focus on probiotics. Yes, you focus on um, herbs like echinacea, astragalus. Um, and then uh, I personally find nystatin in small doses. Let's say the regular dose of nystatin is 500,000 units four times a day. Let's say for children, let's say for a 10 year old child. If I'm working with a smaller child, I would give them a very small dose, let's say 200 units mm -hmm. twice a day and integrate it with natural therapies. We have had such good results with this problem, okay? That, for example, oral thrush, I would do. Uh, if the child can, if I can train the child, I would do hydrogen peroxide for soaks. Uh, I would do hydrogen peroxide or, or goggles. I would bring uh, uh, sesame oil goggles. So there are a lot of things that we can do to get rid of. And those oxygen. are all. Those are all treatments to to increase the oxygen level in the body and help the body. Absolutely. Fight. Because one of the things which uh, led me to suggest this, and I'm just writing a paper, mm -hmm. um, is that the enzyme myeloproxidase has been linked very strong. Originally, it was discovered in the people who have mucocutaneous candidiasis. Mm -hmm. Now, remember another name for um, Kawasaki syndrome is actually mucocutaneous lymph node disease. Mm -hmm. So there are just too many. And the two toxins which have been identified, one is it called CAW-CO, C -A and the other is called CAS-CAS. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at it and I said, could, could it be possible? It's myeloproxidase which turned my mind to the question that we are dealing with a fungal infection, specifically candida. But when I saw the two more, the two other substances, 
One is C-A-W, caw, and then the other is C-A-S. So I said, could the letter C actually represent candida? So I dug into this, and sure enough, CAW stands for candida water-soluble factors, and C-A-S stands for candida substance. So they've already confirmed that the two substances which are known to play a role in, um, in Kawasaki syndrome or Kawasaki disease, they are clearly, clearly related to candida. And the third one is an enzyme myroperoxidase, which originally back in 1855 was isolated, the deficiency was isolated in people who have mucocutaneous candidiasis. So I believe, uh, I am actually trying to finish that paper, but I believe that that's going to make a difference for these children. Okay, let me interrupt you right there. I'm gonna ask you to move your mouse because your camera has frozen up. We can still hear you, but, ah, there you are. And I'm okay. just gonna remind you, give a nudge to your mouse every time I interrupt you. That way the camera will re remain active. Um, okay. One thing I, I read over the weekend that seemed to resonate uh, to my, limit, my, my limited, uh, very limited understanding of medical terms, but something I, I heard from a doctor, an emergency room doctor, uh, quoted um, um, about uh, the COVID syndrome is that he described it as the cell signaling going crazy. Would you con concur, concur with that? Generalizing. I will, I, I will actually agree with that, okay? But you see, the difference is, I heard Dr., um, uh, you know, the woman doctor who is with Dr. Faccio, uh, uh, Oh, Dr. Uh, Bricks, yes. Bucks, Brick, Bucks, I think. Bricks, okay. I heard her saying that, you know, when we have these COVID-19 patients, we don't know what the underlying factors are. I felt so revulsed by that statement. Because all what you need to do is get a urine sample and you will get a very clear marking of the um, oxygen-driven crap cycle, basic energy system. You will also detect the more toxins that are there. Then you do a blood test and you find the insulin. The primary underlying causes, if you dig deep, are related to those three things. Oxygen bioenergetics, insulin bioenergetics, and the gut microbial microbiome garden. So I think for us to say that we don't know who are the people who have underlying causes, and these are the people who are going to lose their lives to virus. Mm. Okay, so I am much more focused on this idea of focusing on the underlying conditions, in other words, weakening the ligaments, uh, weakening the virus, and in simple words, and uh, this myeloproxidase story fully supports it because there's a term called oxygen, um, uh, oxygen burst. Mm. And this enzyme releases oxygen radicals whenever you have invading microbes in the white blood cells, immune cells, as well as another type of immune cells called phagocytes. So the evidence for that is overwhelming in the last almost 150 years. So I am saying when we have solid knowledge on the side of detecting the underlying condition. So my focus is I want to spend more energy on disabling the virus and strengthening our own immune systems. Then I would want to go looking for drugs against the virus or even the vaccine. When vaccine becomes available, that would be good. But remember, Ebola vaccine does not work. And flu vaccine by and large does not work. So I would not want to celebrate this thing that when the flu vaccine comes, we will forget about this virus. No, I don't think that's going to be a good strategy. And I'm afraid there are a lot of people, possibly this is the president's fault or other people's fault, but there are a lot of people who, who are just waiting for, oh, all they need to do is get the virus out and then we'll all be okay. And really thinking about that statement, we've been told by real medical people, uh, yourself included, that a virus will, uh, um, um, a vaccine will take at least 12 to 18 months. And also thinking that we can do that in the short term and then produce over in excess of 300 
million doses to cover every man, woman, and child in the United States who's, who's vulnerable, that is not realistic at all. That's not, that's not going to happen. I think we should continue to make every effort that we can to get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Because we know from experience, I mentioned that flu and uh, no, uh, polio and uh, smallpox, are, they are really glaring examples of what success can be, okay? So I think we should. But my focus keeps coming back that in view of the long history of moderate to poor results of flu vaccine, and the strong, strong evidence that this strategy, for example, look at Sweden. Sweden did not shut down the country. Sweden did not really go through, everybody did not die there. In fact, I heard ambassador of Sweden saying that they are far, far happier with their choice now that they've done it they're on the other side than other European countries. So I think this notion that you can just keep the virus out. Social distancing makes sense. If anything else, you are trying to be respectful of people around you because they may, they may not be in a state of knowledge that they are really get a, a certain inner strength to say this is not the end of the world. So I believe that, uh, I hope that one legacy of COVID-19 would be cumulative evidence coming from different sources, converging evidence, which would say, we must continue to focus on the host, on the person. Mm -hmm. And then if you are going to combine those, there is no reason why we can't set up some studies with using hydrogen peroxide for soaks, even hydrogen peroxide intravenous strip. If you are going to do a national study for that, remember now, EDT chelation. The mainstream people fought it for 55 years. Finally, when Congress allocated about $160 million for doing an EDT accumulation study, that paper was published finally in the Journal of American Medical Association. You know what they said? They said for people who have had a heart attack and who have diabetes, no other program gives you the protection from heart disease as EDT accumulation. That's a glaring example that, you know, the system or the status quo or the powers to be, they're so committed to the hierarchical structure that profits them that they are not open to looking at all the other things. Now, one other thing, if COVID-19 compels us by whatever influence it has, that we become more focused on the diabetes prevention or more focused on strengthening the immune system or immune problems or more focused on breathing better. For example, we had a program on ginger vapor treatment. For example, we had a program on glutathione with the, with the nebulizer. Okay. So if out of this epidemic, there comes a strong movement, authentic knowledge, the key element to me is authentic knowledge. And you can't simply say, well, you're, they belong to the other side. That's nonsense. You can look at their data. You can see what the editorial boards said about their data, whether they were published. I think we need both. That's the bottom line. I think by constantly putting our eggs uh, against the virus, we have not had a good track record. Right, and then putting all, all your eggs in one basket, the, ba the virus itself, the enemy, is moving on all fronts and adapting so that it can find more hosts. This is an evolving, you know, correct? Richard, if you would give me a minute. Please. I am going to quote a news item report from the journal Science. Remember... When you consider American science journal, the journal science is the top among the American science journals. Mm -hmm. There, the chief of the National Institute of Virology of Japan and the chief of the National Institute of Virology of Germany, they happened to be together at a private dinner meeting. There were some other prominent virologists, their close friend, they invited them into. 
They then asked the chief of virology of the Japanese. This comes from the journal Nature, and I'm actually I put it on the Facebook. And uh, so, but that to me, what did they really say? They said China has a clear, demonstrated, documented record of keeping secret hundreds of flu mm. outbreaks, where there were a minimum of 300 reported deaths where there was something like 10,000 uh, the local people went into self-quarantine. And then these things did so. How is the international community going to deal with this problem? As long as the Chinese are keeping and they have become masters of uh, weaponizing these flu viruses. This COVID-19 is not a coincidence. They have been working on it for a very long time. And Fauci said that no, he believes in Chinese information. That's because Fauci has been working with, Fauci has been getting some of those postgraduates from China. And so you do develop a personal relationship. Also, Fauci is part of that American group which has been funding the Wuhan Institute of Biology. That's where this virus came from. So I believe that when international community looks at it, they have to find a way to pull the drugs out of China. Do you know what? I, I bought the mask box, three boxes of masks. It's right. made up in China. Everything. It's yeah. made up in China. Yes. So what a wonderful strategy Chinese have. First, they manufacture these things and then they will export their viruses. So people have to buy this. So this idea, I think we Americans should be deeply, deeply embarrassed by the fact that Chinese are making close to 90% of our medication. Some blood thinners, some crucial elements, they are producing almost 100%. How did this happen? Where were our presidents? Specifically, where was President Obama? Where was President George Bush before that? They knew this was happening. And when, you know, our, our the presidential candidate uh, Biden. Biden, right? Biden, right? Yes. So yes. when he was Biden, saying that Chi vice president, yes, right. So when he was saying that Chinese are our friends and we have to do all that, where was he? Where, 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 where was his mind as to the Chinese are taking over? They took all our digital technology. They took our computers. Joe, Steve Jobs. Obama asked Steve Jobs. Can we bring in all the jobs which went to China, uh, Apple company? He said, no, they are gone forever. Well, where is the responsibility of the corporate people who are in a position to make a difference that they are allowing this? Do you know the Boeing also has a plant now in China? Boeing airline, you know, makers? Okay. So, and General Motors have their uh, automobile engines, uh, you know, plants there. So we have a strange idea that Chinese, first we say that there are clear, clear, you know, uh, dictatorship. And then they talk about, we talk about, you know, collaborating with them. And if this pandemic does not awaken the world about the problems of dictatorial company and countries, which allow this kind of a research to go on, the only purpose they did this was to weaponize they, they, you can, I can clearly see all the PhDs and the other scientists in that Wuhan Institute of Virology, that when they're working day to day to day and they're measuring the mutation, is it plausible that they are not thinking about what the effect is? What they do is they get the viruses, they create the condition that the viruses are mutating at a much higher rate than they ordinarily do. So you have, put, you have produced a crop and then whatever the information is, uh, they did not let people, the Chinese local people, leave Wuhan for about three, four months. It is as if they are marinating the virus. It is made, they are deliberately increasing the toxicity. And when they think it has reached the enough mutation, then they say, okay, all people can leave to different countries, different parts of China from Wuhan. And then from that rest of the China, they went to all over the world. That's what happens. Sounds like this sounds like the 21st century version of biological warfare. Yes. 
Yes, it is. You yes, had it is. described to me. You had described to me. But I want to consider this, uh, Richard. I want to come back to my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. What can we do to strengthen our own natural immune defenses against invaders like that? Mm -hmm. Because I think that when we focus more on ourselves, then this information plays a role that you know they will keep coming up with um, COVID-20 and COVID-22 and COVID-24. And if we, don't, if we don't provide a counterbalance, effective counterbalance to that problem, then I'm afraid that the drugs and the vaccine strategy is not going to be satisfied. Now, I'm afraid, you, I wish I could say it differently. Okay. Yeah, you related to me, um, that you were hospitalized in 2012 with uh, a, a very serious illness. 2001. I'm sorry, 2001. 2001. Yes, and you had a very serious illness, and um, a doctor that you were working with, or a doctor that was treating you, um, went against conventional knowledge and did not put you on a ventilator. Um, can you briefly describe your episode with that and how it informs your knowledge of today's COVID-19. This is a very, very important issue. It was 2001. I was serving as president of Capital University of Integrative Medicine in Washington. We were going to get uh, a Department of Education to come and visit us, inspect us for our accreditation and things didn't go right for the university at that time so we did not but i got a bad flu and i had to stay there for three days because of the special responsibilities that i had by the time i came i had fever and i have hypertension low blood pressure that is a dangerous sign usually it means septicemia which means that the microbes are multiplying actively in the circulating blood that's the term septicemia means so I walked into the hospital four hours, five hours later, they coded me. I was there for about three weeks. And I had rising liver enzymes, which means the virus had caused hepatitis like picture. I had uh, rising creatinine, the, the first of the liver enzymes. I had rising creatinine, which means my kidneys are being affected. I had low blood pressure. I had cardiac rhythm problems, which the monitors could see. And uh, so, my friend, pulmonologist, who was taking care of me, very bravely decided that he did not want to, me to put on ventilators. And then next day, when I was feeling a little bit better, then I said, uh, he smiled and he said, well, you're looking better. I said, thank you very much. I feel better. He said, uh, I got a lot of criticism on your account. I said, why would you get criticized? By who? He says, Majid, you are some kind of a celebrity in this hospital. You just finished two years presidency, two terms as elected president. You are chief of pathology. You are laboratory director. Everybody knows you are at Columbia. You write books, etc." So when they found out that you are in the ICU, everybody in administration, everybody in medical staff, everybody in nursing staff knew that Dr. Ali is there. Okay. And so they wanted to come to show their support, that was nice to visit me. But they had to stop them from ICU that he can't take too many visitors, but you can wave his, your hand through the window. So when he finished this story, I said, this story is wonderful, I'm feeling better and you saved my life, thank you. But you haven't answered my question. Why did you not? Because they were saying he's breathing hard for his breath. He's exhausted with the effort of breathing. His heart is going crazy. And that's because he doesn't have oxygen. He has low blood pressure. He has septicemia, which is affecting his kidney and the liver. Why would you not? Richard, when you are an inhalation therapist, or when you are a pulmonologist, or you're a resident, and the blood value, blood tests show that the level of oxygen saturation, or the functionality of oxygen, that's more important. That's low. The first instinct is to add more oxygen to the ventilator. And then the second instinct is to put the oxygen in with the ventilator at a higher pressure. Those are the two things which create oxygen toxicity. 
and the inner surfaces of alveolar alveoli that come, come for air air spaces in the lungs air sacs in the lungs okay they're called alveoli those have special sensors not only for oxygen conditions but also for viruses which are going to be thread to this try to think about evolutionary wisdom try to imagine what goes on in nature to create the system it totally appalls me not appalls me but it fascinates me astounds me this year so when governor como said that 80% of the people who go on the ventilators they don't come off it they lose their lives i was not surprised i think that is a, just that's what is expected don't put people on ventilator until you have a clear strategy of taking them off and then he said 80% died and then i was looking at the internet there's some other report up to 88% people who were on ventilators went on to die so my question richard is that all this you know the cost of ventilators and the fighting on ventilator for god's sake why don't we go on television and radio and let people know what they can do with ginger vapor treatment with menthol vapor treatment with vicks vicks vapor up my sister was telling me that she brought her three daughters up whenever they had a cold and they would get a little bit of a wheezing like effect you know she would just rub the inside of the nostril with uh, big vapor up okay and then she would ask them to uh, breathe some uh, vapor treatment and then she says them the secretions in the lungs then out and the breathing is better there is so much indigenous inflammation the issue is that when there are some people who don't do any research themselves they take other people's reports and they play with the data and they come up with their interpretation richard at this time future is going to very harshly judge dr fauci very harshly judge because you cannot keep secret of pandemic scale damage to people's jobs and their lives and their health and the terror you can't keep them okay eventually it will come that why did the scandinavians do not, not do this why did sweden not do this and when we had to do that there is for example i was at mountain state the um, bear mountain uh, bear mountain park and uh, i was there i think 3 days ago there were a lot of families with children you know they were having picnics there and then next day i went for a walk on hackensack park which is by hackensack river where we are right now in this office there were a lot of people there and you know they yes they seem to have an awareness of social you know but they in the children with you know family picnics i think their parents they at least were wearing the masks mm. so that means that they had the awareness i i think that we have to have find a balance that we don't allow to commit all our resources to the to demonizing the viruses as bad as they are but remember it's us chain people humans who are demonizing the viruses we took those viruses and we made them much more dangerous you know this uh, this um, covid 19 is a chinese gift to the rest of the world you know the chinese people would get angry if they listen to me they probably complain etc but the whole world knows and that nature that science report to me was the most telling the chief of virology of one country japan is having a private meal with the chief of virology of the national institute of germany and they get this they are having some friends and they just join and that's what the data they are discussing and they they, they are reported did slide into it from some place he said they were stunned the audience were stunned at that this large scale these viruses are being when we call novel viruses under the present conditions they are actually manufacturing novel viruses and so in the total if you are looking at it in terms of a concept from a human human kind's perspective of these problems 
then I think uh, the effort has to be multi-directional. Uh, it is, and suppose somebody gets very tired because their coronavirus test was positive and that they put the fear of God in them. And suppose they said, okay, let me try these better dietary programs. Let me try some of these herbs. Let me try some of these indigenous things. What is the harm there? The reality is that they will suffer from the empirical benefits that other people have been doing for a long time. And they, are, they used to pass it on without objection. And now the new thing is, well, there is no scientific study. That's always a cop out. These people who say there's no scientific study, no. Don't badmouth any natural therapies unless you have clear evidence that that has done any harm or it is totally valueless. And there, Richard, why would our grandmothers and our aunts and keep doing some things which have no value? Why would, what would there be motive? And Remember, why was it passed is, through? Why was it passed through from generation to generation for so long? Right. Those generations right. not only survived, they thrived. Right. That's why, that's why, you see, that's my point, that a person could make a mistake or he gets carried away by his own thing. But if you have no profitability, cross-generational traditions, just like my sister was saying, she said, you know, she has three daughters and, you know, she said, we didn't give them any antibiotics. Hmm. The hidden cost of giving the medications for an easier fix. You see, we don't we don't talk about that. When we start people on sleeping pills and we stop them and start them on antibiotics or steroids or you know these painkillers, you know the opiates and the oxycodones. I think we have to factor that in. Now the other thing. Somebody was, my sister told me this. She said, you know, there was one of these plagues going. And so somebody asked this plague, this story, where are you going? And she's saying, I'm going to that province. So they said, how many people are going to, are you planning to, you know, kill the plague? So the plague said, no, I am going to be, you know, only doing uh, maybe 2,000 people. So that, that person said to the, the plague, they said, oh my God, but what if we find out that there were 5,000 or 7,000 people who lost their lives? He said, then no, that I only took 2,000 lives. The other died of fear. <laughs> they just <laughs> they kept on talk, to talking about this. Well, you know, these, these, these little things, they are absurd at one level, but they do bring out something, which is the... What is the effect of this terror? Tell me something. All the young women who have young children or women of any age with young children, when they were told that there is a new mysterious illness first detected in London, now the incidence is rising in England and they call it mysterious translation. We don't know what it is and we don't know what the treatment is. What is the impact on those mothers more mothers and fathers of young absolute children. Absolute fear, absolute terror. That's right. So, and I'm saying, you know, I, I feel I haven't really uh, finished the manuscript, but I, I started when I was waiting for you. And this is going to be a sort of a letter to editor. So I think it will get done earlier uh, without the usual delay, etc. But I think this idea of saying that the two toxins which have been recognized, they are derived from candida, that's number one. The enzyme which is coming out under most scrutiny, myeloperoxidase, that was discovered about 150 years ago in people who had systemic mucocutaneous candidiasis. I think there is going to be a very strong, and remember we are not withholding any standard therapies we would like to offer this as a supplemental therapy, okay? And I believe that if a trial was done, uh, there's a very strong probability that this kind of integrative approach. Uh, Richard, and the other thing is, when a, when a mother of a child is told there is no treatment for it, or when a mother is child is told, well, this is what my grandmother used to do, which is my mother to do, and we are going to try that. There is a difference in this thing, right? No. 
there there is not convinced it's it's yeah i mean as i say it's absolutely terrifying you know mothers have been keeping keeping their kids at home and and away and the kids aren't playing with each other they've kept them away from their grandparents they've been doing everything and now they hear and all, all along we've been hearing that uh well it doesn't really affect children and then all of a sudden this super serious thing comes along uh okay. that's been ca called mysterious by just about everybody except for you <laughs> well i was i just was reading this and the things clicked it was CAW, that didn't click anything. Then the next was CAS, that even didn't click. When they said MPO, that is a abbreviation for enzyme myeloperoxidase, that I had written an article a long time ago. I said, no, this is, and that, as I told you, was discovered, I think in 1855, way back then, because they were trying to investigate patients with mucocutaneous candidiasis. And remember, we are calling now, Kawasaki disease, mucocutaneous lymph node disease. So, okay, it's this is so a wonderful trick. And there's a body. This is a body. This of, is empirical trick. Yes. So there's this a body of knowledge trick. and experience with this that could yeah, be applied that really isn't. Right. That's that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, two issues I, I do want to get to. Uh, I want you to remind your viewers. Uh, about what they can do to strengthen their immune systems. But two issues that I'm going to ask you about very quickly. First of all, the president today announced he is taking the hydroxychloroquine. He's been taking it despite, despite the fact that he doesn't have any symptoms and he's just been taking it for, for a week because he thinks it's a good idea, basically. And he's convinced some doctors. You know, Richard, Richard, when a person makes a personal decision for himself mm -hmm. under very, very difficult situations, for example, a person had cancer, he had surgery, he had radiotherapy, chemotherapy. Now, if he goes out to a far-flung area of the world and he finds some, some herbs for his own self, I personally, as a physician, I see I don't see any reason for opposing it um, because this is a desperate situation he's tried everything which was done so that is different than when you are taking me uh, do something to make a political decision if president trump is doing this to make a political statement that i think hydroxychloroquine should be used by more people then i think that's unfortunate okay i think that's not right and I think that I think there's plenty of evidence that that is true because he's been pushing it for quite some time now. Well, that is true. If that is true, if he's making, if he, if his agenda is beyond his own self, then I think it's not, uh, it's not right. Hmm. Okay. Then, then Let me move on. You have to leave this to uh, clinicians who do this kind of a work, and you see they can come up and they can. I noticed that some of the people on TV and some of they are also pushing hydroxychloroquine. Some, some, you know, some so-called journalists. I don't know who they are. It's a malaria drug, correct? Oh yeah, it used to be. Do you know that it the, it it had a name Daraprim when I was in medical school. That is sixty years ago, mm -hmm. and it used to cost in American currency about seven or eight pennies. Um, a tablet and then there was a time it was running into a lot of money here but its safety record is pretty good because it is a it's a malaria protection prevention drug and when we went to africa and we took that uh, you know that uh, what's that big uh, there is a big animal park national park in kenya mm -hmm. uh, sangadi so we were going to be in Serengeti for about uh, two and a half weeks. I took that myself. I suggested to my wife she should take it too, or daughter mm -hmm. too. As so there's no big effect. issue of any unknown toxicity of hydroxychloroquine. Mm -hmm. And then they are also using for lupus and scleroderma. And, you know, they are using it as an immuno-enhancing. A lot of people use that drug. Mm -hmm. let, or, me, uh, let me also ask you about... Um, Today, as, as we're taping this, 
Today in New York State, uh, they opened many, many more testing. Testing for COVID-19 is widely available. I had related to you that I had gotten the test a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was the test that the governor got on TV yesterday where they stick a, a swab way up, up your nostril. Um, so there's, there's basically two, from my understanding, there's two types of tests. One where they test in your nostrils and then another one for antibodies. So can you give me a, a brief comment on each? Yes. I think the question of uh, doing the test uh, for the antigen, and that's a, technically it's called the viral substance. Okay. And the antibody test is the substance of the patient, mm -hmm. substance of the human. Okay. So the source of the first test is uh, the microbial agent, and the source of the second test antibody is from the person, human. Okay. So coming back to the first one, I think those tests are imperative in the early stages because you need to have a precision of the diagnosis. And I think there was an error made earlier on that they um, they did the test which had not been defined for the for the viral substance mm -hmm. that's called antigen. And uh, as a result of that, it was underreported. When these when uh, the what is Stanford? When the Stanford people came, the test had been improved quite a bit. That's my sense. And they uh, reported a much higher incidence of this. Now, then some other things happened, which is when these people were admitted in the hospital, in the emergency room or something, they need a diagnosis. So then they would say COVID-19. And now when this person went on to die for whatever reason, so if he went, went to die with COVID-19, not of COVID-19, then there would be a natural tendency to err on the side of attributing the death to it. So when you put the two things together about the use of the test, one is you are grossly underreporting the number of people who are infected because of the, uh, basically because of the inadequacy of the testing material, okay? And then there is also compound this problem that you are over-reporting some people because you are not being very critical. I think I mentioned in my book, uh, Richard, I, we spoke about it. When I was writing my flu book about Spanish flu in 2006, it came out. And say the, say the name of it, please. The name is The Rooster, The Flu, and The Imperial Medicine of the New Empire. Okay. okay, so I that was about Spanish flu, and by because this was World War II, and Department of Defense had very good data, so there is a very good data on that, and generally it is in the range of between 75 to 100 million people died all over the world with Spanish flu. Okay, so I think that the argument of testing for the material of the virus is very strong, and in the early stages. It was a mistake, especially in California, it happened, that they grossly um, understated the people who were positive tests. In other words, they had been exposed to the virus. But then the circumstances and the fear and the local practices as such. Um, in New Jersey, my associates and I, four of us, and I was there in the hospital about 27, 28 years, and I was serving as a chief for 25 years. The tradition was that if a patient dies in a hospital and you do the autopsy, it is the responsibility of the pathologist to sign the death certificate because he has more information than anybody. I never remember, I remembered never putting flu in the box. One reason for that is that how could we say that this patient has died of flu when we knew that coronary arteries were all blocked, etc., or that there was pneumonia in the lungs, that there were other problems, okay? The blood sugar was way up and the acidity and etc., liver enzymes, etc. So we had at autopsy so much other information that it would be very difficult for anybody to defensively say, no, this person did die of flu. Then I asked my associates, none of them ever used flu in the death certificate. 
Mm. And so I said, where is CDC getting these 32,000 death certifications? And they announced that 32,000 people died of seasonal flu one particular year. Where do they get this information from? They just it's just an estimated thing okay the clinicians will just they can make a distinction between who died of flu virus and who died with flu virus okay mm -hmm. let's understand about now that second come the test is and that test i had an experience our house cleaner asked me would i order this test because she had heard that if the antibody test is positive it means the person is immune okay but right off the bat, that is a wrong statement to make. But anyway, I went along and I gave her a script, so the test was done. Now, I have that report in my bag. I'm carrying it because I want to actually also put it on the Facebook. The report said the test is positive, and that means antibody to COVID-19. So assumption is that this patient has no immunity to it. But then there is a note from the laboratory. This test can also be positive by COVID-2 and COVID-22 and COVID-33 and COVID-229 all the way. That is in, that all the in. flu viruses which were coming before, you see these antibodies are being produced to every year seasonal flu. So they cannot make a distinction that this antibody is specifically for this, this particular strain. So mm -hmm. there are others. The rule in the clinical pathology is that whenever you are testing for an antibody, you can never have 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity. You cannot do that, okay? Uh, which come to think of it, you know, the closest test you think about would be, for example, diagnosis of breast cancer. You have to be a have a diagnostic test which is 100% sensitive and 100% specific because you don't want even one woman to lose a breast out of 100 or 1,000 who really does not have cancer and it was false positive, okay? Or you don't want to have a woman whose cancer is not diagnosed for another four years, and then she goes on to with bad thing. Uh, so in immunology testing, the rule is that never, never talk about 100% sensitivity, 100% specificity. Mm -hmm. So when you do the antibody test, you are in that difficult zone. So I think what people have to say, not make this general statement, that if your antibody test is positive, you are immune. That's not defensible. It's not. It's not. It's not necessarily true. Let me uh, let me ask you to remind your viewers once again what they can do to increase uh, their body's natural defenses against the COVID nineteen and other such diseases. Uh, having to do specifically with oxygen? What are the, some of the simple things you can, that anybody can I do? I think, Richard, um, you know, I have pursued this question uh, for almost 45 years now. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been a student of medicine for 62 years. And most of my writings, uh, the journal article books is about, is on these subjects, okay. So, um, my sense is that spiritual equilibrium is the single best approach to getting your body energetics in such a way. We know that maggots grow in meat, which is decomposing, which is basically without oxygen and a lot of acid. Okay, so that is a, that's why, by the way, the Chinese get into the trouble because you know they have these uh, uh, farm animal farms or animal markets, I should say. And it is amazing when you go that in real life. It is such a repulsive thing, you know. There's all kinds of blood everywhere, and there's lizards and snakes and everything put together there, etc. Those are the conditions which invite the viruses for a feast. Okay. But if you have clean conditions like you are in a church or in a synagogue or in a mosque, and the people all there have this sense, you know, the thing that I find is Richard, that um, I don't know how you would take it. You are in New York and I'm in Hackensack and we are off working off the Zoom. But I feel good here that I am in your presence. I've known you for a very long time. I know your commitment and you personally helped me with a lot of these things, okay? So I have that kind of a regard for you 
and and you earned it in all these years by helping me in so many areas so now and you probably have if i have this sense that we are sharing a presence courtesy of zoom if i feel lighter here richard you also have to feel lighter at least to some degree lighter in me in the chest means more oxygen because when you are tighter in the chest and the neck muscles and the back muscles etc the muscles are tight they are producing more acids the, the circulation is poor they are not draining the stagnant acids and the stagnant lymph so when you are in a very comfortable position place of prayer that to me is the goal that we should go for it okay as much as we can so of course i have started experimenting myself walking working worship so i'm saying that i was trying to do walking working meditation but now i said i like the word worship better than meditation so i say to my patient find your own way to be in that state wherever you are it means you are a kind of person you are a gentler person you speak softly you are more respectful of other people's sensitivities you know um, sometimes they wear a mask not because i think it is going to do any good you know they have contradicted themselves on the mask so many times so many times you know especially for you okay okay so he just started I wasn't last really... week last week he suddenly appears in white house lawn with a mask last week right. right so okay. i i think these are difficult areas and um, no, but i would wear a mask um, if i feel let's say i'm in an elevator in a building and that's a very good example i would not want to be without a mask in an elevator in a tall building mainly because of my sensitivity to other people i may not actually think of that myself but it just means that it's like poking their eyes okay is like by implication saying what are you worried about it you know your hypochondriac or something like that i think these issues are very real so we have to really be respectful mm -hmm. um what are your thoughts about very quickly and this is kind of a non medical question but what are your thoughts about you've mentioned the possibility of a covid 20 or maybe a covid 21 or a covid 22 uh this we will be dealing with the effects of this for a long time social distancing may take place may have to take place for a long time certain things in society in the world may need to be changed on a permanent level uh just give me your thoughts as a as a person who's seen much of this world and you know spent a lot of time evaluating society and people in general you know richard i am very drawn towards evolutionary perspective mm -hmm. so i try to imagine what were the conditions in eons when we became tribal societies tribal cultures and we learned to look at our food sources and uh, the animals around us etc i think that generally it seems to me that people all over the world are more vulnerable to fears the fears of their medication being perverted the fears of the food not being available but then when we hear that there may be a billion people in uh, in africa continent of africa where they do not have clean water access that thing would be very disturbing to for everyone so i believe that it, there is an alienation maybe for lack of better word we can say spiritual alienation because in the earlier period of time whoever thought that there were racial problems all africa was you know there were not racial problems and uh, europe didn't have any racial problems um, but i think that there is more and more divisiveness the negative the, the results long term are going to be negative and uh, this virus is going to these genes are going to show up just like in igg test the antibody test actually i have it in my desk someplace because i want to put that on the on the facebook it's in my bag uh, but it will take me some time to dig it out so 
this is incomplete information and uh, you know richard just like i have watched you running that organization mn and telemian you saw I don't your run it, but i work within it let's just make yeah. that clear but, I don't want to but, say that but your but the solutions many of your are intuitive they are instinctive okay that comes from just doing something the amazing thing is that uh, uh, you know if you have, it will take me 2 minutes to say this and i will try to be very quick thank you sir jc city um, the chief surgeon was dr hoyaja and um, his wife was a pathologist at our hospital at antinek hospital so he called me one time and he says you know there is a there is a disagreement there is a malignant tumor in the knee and uh, this uh, one pathologist of the hospital has called it cancer the other has called it negative um and there is apparently there is a lymph node there and there is some cells floating into the lymph nodes and so the general sense is that if you find cancer cells floating in the lymph nodes that establish it as a metastatic cancer that the cancer has moved from the origin traveled along the lymph nodes and it's gone there so that is that makes it life easy and there is complete agreement there but there is a second question which is that what we think are floating cancer cells are they floating cancer cells or they are floating non cancer cells they may look like the cells of the liver or cells of the colon or the cells of the stomach when normally the cells of the stomach or the colon they are they are different from lymphoid cells so you can tell easily etc so anyway he called me stressed out and he says i don't know what i'm going to do i said standard thing is you know you get a second consult from one of the new york hospitals columbia is very good mount and memorial is very good or you can send it over to washington dc they have uh, army institute of pathology so he, and then after a week he called me he says you know this thing is getting worse i have a patient there and uh, they are forcing me to keep changing the story and now there are disagreements between nih and memorial columbia so I, he said would you look at me i said i need this like a hole in my head i said okay send me the slide so i look at the slides and i called him back i said you are obligated to explore the patient because you have different reports etc so what i would suggest based on what i have looked at is that don't make open the patient with a long extended incision because now you are looking to explore if there is cancer in the belly and the abdomen has all kind of recesses so i said just go laparoscopically through a small incision and you it will take you a little bit more time but then you won't have the whole thing messed up opened up and then it's very hard for patients you know they have to heal all that thing if you keep yelling pulling, pulling at the open guts and somebody's body so he called me back and he said that you know it was good because i think you mentioned it at the last moment that i have to go in and so i did and you said go to a smaller incision and use a laparoscope and he said laparoscope it can be very called exploratory laparotomy when you don't have a diagnosis and you go into this so and uh, then he said he was very happy he said you know it was good then he said i have this question for you you said to me you didn't say i think it is cancer you didn't say i think it is benign you spoke a very different language i was thinking about this when i was operating on the patient and exploring all this your words kept on saying i said he did not speak like the other pathologist did he was he went to my medical school and we were together in our residency so we knew each other very well and his wife and our children were friends so it was a different context so i said listen you asked me to look at it and i saw those cells too but i i just i, I just didn't think that was cancer so we he talked about it but he kept on he was very curious he kept on to me he said why did you're talking about a very important decision the patient is a cancer or the patient doesn't have a cancer and the way you spoke you said go through a small incision and spend more time with a laparoscope because you won't find a cancer he said i know your words because you said at one level you won't find cancer how could you be that dogmatic when all there is a disagreement so 
I said, I don't know, it's just intuition. It's just, he says, you are making a diagnosis and intuition. I said, that's what everybody does. They don't admit it, I just admit it. So then after, sometimes later we were at a dinner at their place, and then he just came back to the subject. He says, how did you know? I'm mean, very curious. I was talking to my wife, um, and she works with you, neurologist. And she says, you know, doctor, he does some things like that. Okay, he's known for doing things like that. He said, but I want to. I said, I can't make things up just to amuse you, okay? We are talking about diagnosis of cancer. There's a second opinion issue, third opinion issue, more stains, more take, more material. A lot of things are done to resolve this. Ultimately, we say that, that on the report, we say there's no complete consensus among the patients, and the opinion is this and this, and you know, we say this evidence supports this point of view, and that evidence supports this point of view, and so we can take a definitive statement. He said, no, you said you won't find the cancer. I want to know why. So I was thinking about that. I said, okay, let me try this. See, cancer cells, cancer cells are cells in a fighting mode. When you have a floater cell, benign cells, which are carried, let's say, from the uterus after a menstrual cycle, they get into the blood or into the lymphatics and they're carried into the regional lymph nodes. You know, they look like, obviously, they are foreign to the lymph nodes and they are epithelial cells, the cells lining the uterus, etc. So this complete agreement, those are epithelial cells. So then this does become a problem. So I think that, first of all, I was not worried. I said, there are so many people with so many differences of opinion, nobody's going to hang me and nobody's going to sue me. <laughs> because I am one of the many people who are disagreeing. And, but I kept on looking at it, kept on looking at it. And I said, these cells don't look like they're fighter cells. They're non-fighting cells. He said, have you, have you ever heard this? I said, no, I've never heard about this. He said, do you pathologists talk like this? I said, no, I don't think that they talk like this. So he said, you're pushing me. What do you expect from me? So you said, but what was it? So I too told you that. I was look, kept on looking at it, looking at it, because there was so much controversy. And finally, the voice said, you know, no, 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 those cells are not dirty cells. They're not fighting cells. They, they can't be cancer cells. So, but then also, the cost of my decision, since you are going to explore and you are not going to do a cancer surgery and you are going to take a biopsy if you think there is cancer, I am on a very, there is not much room that I would end up making a disastrous mistake under this setting. Because all I'm doing is cautioning an experienced surgeon that be careful where you walk. Um, because that this may not be the traditional thing. Now apply that to what Dr. Fauci is saying. I always was very respectful of him. He wrote a chapter in a textbook of medicine way back when. But as I saw him in this year, Richard, let's be real. It's interesting that I gave you this example. I was not thinking about Fauci at that time. You know, we bend over backwards. It's called sharing responsibility. It's called sharing the burden of diagnosis. So you go to walk over and say to this pathologist, and look at it, please, you go to that pathologist. He says, let's do those more sections. Let's take one. When I compare that 35 million people lost their jobs, and there's one man who's making those decisions, and he's contradicting himself, and to begin with, you know, he's playing the role of a politician. He's not playing the role of a doctor. Okay, oh, that's, that's what that. I'm thinking all along. These, these decisions are so politically motivated, not by scientific facts. But please go so ahead. That, that's my point. That he could have done something very simple. He could have said, he could have made four or five calls of the people that he trusts, experienced people in different parts of the country or the world. And he says, listen, guys, I need your help, okay? So what we will do is I'll have all the data and I am going to draw my inferences, but I would like to see if you can look at that and if you can give me what is your sense. This is just called sharing responsibility. Mm -hmm. If, Richard, you were making a decision that 35 million people could lose their jobs, wouldn't you want to consult some other people and share the responsibility? Yes, okay? So I think that... Fauci has failed in many, many ways. I was thinking that I'm diagnosing the cancer of one person 
and I'm going through all this talking about sharing responsibility, sharing the burden, you know. We, knew, we, we lose nothing if we get another opinion. It's our ego that I'm going to ask for it. Ego has no place in medicine. <laughs> you can't do that. And we are talking about diagnosing one person's cancer. Maybe it's a breast cancer and it can be easily removed. And that's the end of that. He's talking about, you, may, you asked a very important question earlier on. You said, what would be the long-term impact of these events? The total picture, what Chinese did, what we did, what happened to Italy, and what three people did. I think it has traumatized human psyche deeply. I think that trauma will show up in different ways. I think it has discredited medical profession closely. I think that they have been contradicting. For example, this issue of uh, Mac, uh, this, uh, you know, these uh, face masks, face that masks. they are not useful, they are useful, do it, don't do that, etc. So all the people who are doing this, we are losing credibility. You know, people are more doubtful about this. There was a time you had a family doctor and he looked into your throat and he was your guy and, and they were not distracted. They were not, they were not prescribing things that they were told to prescribe. So there used to be a very high standard. Uh, similarly, people of faith, they did a lot of healing work. There was a time. Now people of faith have lost the confidence of uh, their, um, their their worshippers. Mm. You know, when these people came from India, Maharishi Guru and this and that, New York Times had a very good expose. They, item by item, they went to these big guys who were driving seven Rolls Royces in Carolina. And, you know, he comes from India and he is here to, you know, they were giving the same mantras to, to 1,500 people and tell them that you cannot share this mantra word with That's anyone perfect. else. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that the credibility is a big issue, and I think we have suffered a lot. Uh, obviously, we have, and you know, one of the one of the true ways to fight this is good information. And um, oh yes, you you have, have you have done a lot in the past hour um, to to further the cause of good information. And before we go, I just want to remind everybody, for more good information uh, from Dr. Ali, there is tons of it online. Um, uh, the, probably the best place to go right now is the website majidalimd.me, M-A-J-I-D-A-L-I-M-D dot M-E. And uh, also, just to remind everybody, uh, go to Potomatic uh, and search the name Dr. Majid Ali for the Science, Health, and Healing podcast as well. And uh, we want to thank everybody who's watched us on Facebook Live. And again, thank you for your patience in, in all of our technical endeavors tonight. And of course, you can see Science, Health, and Healing every Saturday night at 9 on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Dr. Ali, I thank you so much for, the, for your time and all of this good information. Richard, you have, you have been a very good personal friend. So it's, a, it's wonderful to consider a project like that. Ah, thank you. I'm flattered. And again, as I say, it's good to see you again. And I hope to see you soon. May you be gracious, graceful, and generous in your spirit.